Well, good evening and welcome to the Ocean County Baptist Church live stream this evening. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we will be in the book of 1 Peter this evening, 1 Peter chapter number 2. Um, I'll just wait a couple of seconds while everybody gets their videos all set up and gets all settled in and turns in their Bible. Uh, don't forget, at 6 p.m., a pastor will be uh, bringing the challenge from the Word of God at 6 p.m. right after uh, this devotion time. But I want to be uh, an encouragement to you this evening. I pray everyone continues to be safe and uh, hopefully not getting too stir crazy. Um, but we are thankful for the Lord's protection and the Lord's guidance. And so we do continue to pray for one another. Encourage you to reach out to some folks in our church. Um, you know, there are many, many of us out there. And we've been receiving phone calls and we've been trying to reach out to others. And I know many others have done the same thing. So continue to encourage one another during this difficult time. All right, First Peter chapter number 2. We're going to read two verses, verses 9 and verse 10. Verses 9 and 10. The Bible says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you, Lord, for our Lord, the blessings we have in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege to preach your word. Thank you, Lord, that we have the ability through live stream to reach so many in our church and others, uh, Lord. And so we're just thankful that you've provided this opportunity to for us, Lord. And I do pray that you would bless the teaching and the preaching of your word this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Book of 1 Peter, as Peter writes this book, he's primarily writing um, to the Jews, to the to believers. However, in the back of his mind are the Gentiles. And we know that um, if you read in, in the epistles uh, that Paul wrote, that Peter and Paul had their disagreements from time to time and would have confrontations from time to time. Um, Peter's been... Uh, referred to as the disciple to the Jews and Paul the you know the apostle or the disciple to the to the Gentiles but here as Peter's writing it's primarily to the Jews um, but with the Gentiles in mind and I say that because in verse 10 where we just read he says which in time past were not a people that's who the Gentiles were and are but are now the people of God so we know that he has them in his mind in the book of first uh, Peter there's couple of different topics and things that, that are covered. One of them um, is the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He speaks about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He also speaks about the suffering that the Christian will have to endure. Um, you know, he doesn't sugarcoat and he basically is telling you, hey, listen, there will be suffering that comes. However, we do have hope. And that's what I want to talk about today because I do believe that there is a lot of hope in the way that Peter writes this and the things that Peter is communicating. Why? Because of who we are. Because, and in the verse that we're going to look at this evening in verse number nine, I look at it as the fourfold position that we have in Jesus Christ. And you can say, well, there's others too, but we're just going to be looking at verse number nine of 1 Peter today in chapter number two, that we have in Jesus Christ. Let me just give you, go back a little bit. And we're going to, in verse one, just touch on a couple of verses really quickly. In verse number three, the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which has according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So he's saying, hey, you do have hope. Why do we have hope? Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We've heard messages preached by Pastor Lionel and Pastor Anthony over the last couple of weeks about that specific topic. How our hope is because there's a resurrection and because we believe in the resurrection and because we believe Christ rose again, that we do have hope. We do have hope. In verse number four, it says, to an inheritance incorruptible. We have an incorruptible inheritance as believers in Jesus Christ. You know, one day, one day, we have a home that Christ is preparing for us even now in heaven. And one day we'll be with our Savior forevermore. An incorruptible inheritance inheritance. You know, when you're a, a child of someone who is very well to do, there is an inheritance that you receive when that, per, that parent or that uh, relative passes on. 
Um, but that inheritance is a corruptible one. That's one, something that's going to burn up like wood, hay, and stubble. You're not going to be able to take it with you. But the inheritance that we have in Christ is an incorruptible inheritance. It's sealed forevermore. And we're thankful that we can have hope because of the resurrection of Christ. And we can look forward to that inheritance that's incorruptible when we beat our Savior face to face. In verse number 5, it says, Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Aren't you thankful that we're kept by the power of God? That we're not kept by anything that we have to do? That we don't have to do anything day after day after day to keep that promise that God has given to us. We're kept by the power of God. Verse number 6, he says, Wherein ye greatly rejoice. And listen, we should be rejoicing. We just celebrated the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But you know what? We should rejoice in that every day. Not just on Easter Sunday, not just on Palm Sunday, but every day we should rejoice in the resurrection because it's the resurrection of Christ that gives us the hope. Listen, you look at all other religions and all things that they're placing their faith and trust in. And as, as I was going through, I was taking, uh, I was, I was um, doing a, an apologetics class this week, and one of the things they spoke about was exactly that. Listen, you go in all those other tombs, and you know what you're going to find? You're going to find that person in there, except one. And that's the one of Jesus Christ. You go there, you know what you're going to find? Nothing. Because he rose. We know he rose. And that's our hope. And we can rejoice in that. We can be excited about that. In verse number 8, he talks about that joy again. Whom having not seen, ye love. In whom though ye, now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Our joy unspeakable. You can't even put words and thoughts to how much joy we have because of what Christ has done for us. Think about it. That's the joy we need to have. You say, well, you know, it's a tough time to be joyful. No, it's the perfect time to be joyful because when everything else around us is failing, when everything else around us is falling apart, that's when we need to turn to the Lord and that's when we need to seek our joy and our refuge and go to the secret place where we know that God is protecting us and he's watching out for us and we can have joy unspeakable. You know, when David was in those dark places, where did he turn? He turned to the Lord. He said, the Lord is my salvation. The Lord is my salvation. He didn't say my armies. He didn't say my strength, my, my intelligence, my ability to, to fight a good war. No, you know what he said? The Lord is my strength. The Lord is my salvation. And that's what we need to do. Listen, even in the times that we're dealing with right now, we can still have joy unspeakable. We can still experience that joy. Why? Because the resurrection didn't stop, didn't not happen because of what we're going through. It's as real today as it was five months ago, ten years ago. It's as real today as it was then. And we can experience that unspeakable joy. Then he says in verse 13, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober. That's kind of the idea like, hey, you know, be prepared. Prepare yourself. Be careful. Guard your mind. Be sober. You know, he, he, Peter goes on to tell us later on in chapter number five, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And there is a real enemy, and there is, and not, the, listen, even in these times, you know what the devil would like nothing more than to have our hearts turned away from God, just because of complacency. Well, we're not in church, so it's really not important. No, now it's more important than ever. Amen. It's more important than ever now. Listen, the church didn't stop ceasing because we don't meet in this building. Amen. The church is the people of God. Amen. And the people of God still are here. Listen, we're all watching. We're all gathered together, whether it's in front of our TVs, our laptops, our phones, whatever it is. You are the church of God. You are the church of Jesus Christ. Amen. It is not this building. And so we get to chapter number two. And because of these things, you know, Peter's trying to be an encouragement. He's trying to provide hope. He's trying to say, listen, and he'll go on to talk about this later on. Listen, there's going to be suffering that's going to come. And there's going to be times of suffering that's going to come. But you can be hopeful. You can be joyful. You can rejoice. Because you know what? The promises of God are as sure today as they were before those sufferings came. Amen. And they'll be as sure during the sufferings and after those sufferings. Amen. Then you get to verse number 9. And he says, but ye, but ye are a chosen generation. What a, what a, what a, you know, every time I read this verse, I just get chills thinking about it. 
You're a chosen generation. You know, in the Old Testament, we know that the, and I'm not comparing the Old Testament to the New Testament, but in the Old Testament, you know, the Israelites were God's chosen people. Do you know that when we came to Christ, we became a chosen generation? Yes, Isn't that awesome? Isn't that tremendous? What a great thought. First Peter chapter number one, verse two says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. Now listen, I, I, when we talk about, you know, foreknowledge and election and all those things, we're not talking about that, you know, God had already determined he's going to be saved and he's not. That's not what we're talking about. We know God knows in his, in his infinite wisdom who will accept him and who will reject him. But we still have a free will to make that decision. In first, I'm sorry, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, it says, But we are bound to give thanks all the way to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. We are a chosen generation because we are saved through sanctification. Amen. We are saved through sanctification. It is a working, as we read in 2 Thessalonians, of the spirit of God. In John chapter 6 and verse 63, it talks about this. In John chapter 6, verse 63, it says, It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh prophet is nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. It is the spirit that quickeneth us. Listen, we can sit here and say to ourselves, well, you know, I'll get saved later. Many times you witness to folks, and um, you know, we've heard different preachers, pastors sent from the pulpit, and you witness and you give them the gospel message and you, you preach salvation and say, I'm just not ready. Later. You know, and what they mean is, I have things I still want to do that coming to the Lord may interfere with. So later, and what we're basically saying is, I'll get saved in my time. No, we don't. That's right. Listen, you're making the assumption that that calling is going to be there all the time. And listen, God calls the believer. I look back and I think about how, how God worked in my life and in my wife's life. And listen, I didn't know what I was looking for. But I knew that something was tugging. As I look back, tugging at my heart, something was missing. There was a void. There was an emptiness. People would ask me, how did you know? I said, I didn't. I just knew there was an emptiness. You know what filled that emptiness? God. Jesus Christ. That's what filled that emptiness. And, you know, it wasn't anything I did. It was the Holy Spirit's prompting. And the, the providential circumstances and the moving of the hand of God in our lives that brought us to the place to make that decision. Now, listen. We still have free will choice. And we heard the gospel message. And we understood. And it was explained to us. But we could have very easily have said no. But praise God for his mercy and his grace. If it wasn't for God's grace and his mercy, where would any of us be today? And so we get to the place where we understand that, listen, the sanctification is by the Spirit of God. It has nothing to do with us. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 8 and 9, it says, For by grace are you saved. By grace. And then it goes on to say, not of works, lest any man should boast. It is not about anything we can do. It is the spirit that quickeneth or makes us alive, not us. We don't get to choose when. We don't get to choose how. We don't get to say, you know, how we do it. Now listen, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of people today who will tell you, listen, there are many ways to salvation. No, there aren't. There's one way, and that's through Jesus Christ. Amen. He says, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Well, if you believe that Jesus Christ is God, then you have to believe that every word that he speaks is truth. Well, if every word he speaks is truth, and he says, I am the way, the truth, and life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me, that pretty much says it's only through Christ that we can be saved. Amen. In Ephesians chapter number 1 and in verse 4, <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 1 and in verse number 4, the Bible says, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. What a great promise. And then again in 2 Timothy chapter 1, the Bible says in verse 9, who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling. Here it is, not according to our works but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. You know, God had a plan of salvation before we were even a thought. Before we were born, God already had the plan all laid out. 
And it wasn't by anything we could do. It, that, that verse is very clear. Not according to our works. Many people think that, you know, that we can earn and work our way to heaven. No. It's not our works. And it goes on to say, but according to his own purpose and grace. Amen. It's by the grace of God. So we're a chosen generation because we're saved through sanctification. We're also very blessed. In, uh, in John chapter 15 and in verse number 16, you know, we, we, we are blessed. As being a chosen generation, we're tremendously blessed. Verse chapter, uh, I'm sorry, John 15, verse 16 says, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you, that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the, of the Father in my name, he may give it you. We're blessed. We're blessed. You know, if you look at that verse, he says, You haven't chosen me, but I've chosen you. See, so we, we think that. Well, you know, I think it's time for me to come to the Lord. That's not the way it works. God chooses you. Yeah. Praise the Lord that he does. You know what I see in that verse? We're blessed. Why? Because we have the blessings of, number one, serving God. Number two, witnessing for God. And number three, testifying of God. You know, we get to serve God. What a privilege and a blessing to serve the Lord. Mm -hmm. You say, well, it's a lot of work. Sometimes there's a lot of, 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 of disappointment that comes along with it. Yeah, but remember the joy unspeakable we spoke about in the during the trials, that's still there. Are there disappointments when when you don't when people aren't fulfilling the, the calling that God has put on their life? Yeah, there is. But I know that we can still experience joy unspeakable. Why? Because God promises it to us. Mm -hmm. So we can serve the Lord. There's blessings. We witness for the Lord. You know, isn't it great that we have not only do we get to witness of what God's done in our life, but we actually have a story to tell. We get to tell people what God's done in our life. That's exciting to me. I love to hear salvation testimony. I love to hear people tell about how they got saved, how God worked in their lives, how you could just see the hand of God in every aspect of their lives. That's exciting to me. Amen. But not only that, not only witnessing for God, but about testifying of God. <clears throat> Think about all the things that God has done in your life and yeah. so much that we have to testify about. Think about it. Even through this, you say, man, I've been locked up for over a month. I don't know that I have much to testify. Listen, think about this. We have a roof over our head. Yeah. We have people that we can spend it with. Amen. We have means through video, through phones, through whatever, to talk to other people. There are people praying for one another. Yeah. You know what that is? That's testifying of the goodness of God and the hand of God, using the people of God to work in other people's lives. Right. That's a blessing. And the, and the second part of that verse, he says, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. You know there's blessings in answered prayers? Now, God may not answer the prayers the way we want them answered, but God hears and answers prayer. Mm -hmm. So we're a chosen generation. I've got to move quickly. Secondly, we're a royal priesthood. A royal priesthood. Revelation chapter 1, verse 5 and 6, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. We're a royal priesthood. There's nobody else that stands other than the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no man that stands as a priest on our behalf except Jesus Christ. Amen. And guess what? We are now a royal priesthood. Now I thought about this. You know, royal talks about, you know, the royalty, kingliness. Priesthood is the priest, you know, the, the office of the priest. You know, in the Old Testament, those two offices were separate. There was the kings and there was the priest, but they were separate. Mm -hmm. But you know, in Jesus Christ, they're one. Because Jesus Christ is our high priest, yeah. and he is the king of kings. Yeah. And so both of those offices in the New Testament, in Jesus Christ, became one. And we... We, in 1 Peter chapter number 2, and verse 5, says, Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. We're spiritual sacrifices. You know, that's giving our lives, our thoughts, our heart, everything to Him. To sacrifice unto Him. Not things, but spiritual sacrifices. You know, do we, do we surrender every thought? The Bible says, and I can't remember the verse, we're casting down every imagination. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Everything. Do we surrender it all to Jesus Christ? Because those are spiritual sacrifices. You know, in our, in our, in our, in our own sinful, uh, you know, in, in the old man, so to speak, 
you know, we want to think about things we shouldn't be thinking about. You know, I always tell the kids, I said, you know, it's, it's always easier to do wrong. It's always easier to do wrong. It requires an effort to do what's right. Because we're bent on wanting to do wrong. But praise God that in Christ, we do have the ability to choose right and to do right and to make those spiritual sacrifices. Why? To bring praise and honor and glory to Jesus Christ. In, in Revelation chapter number 4, I guess i got to talk faster. In Revelation chapter number 4, and in verse number 11, the Bible says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. And then in Revelation chapter 5, uh, Re chapter five and if you read through verses 12 and on, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And if you read on, it continues to go on and worship and praise Jesus Christ. Listen, we need to cast down all imaginations, get rid of all those thoughts that don't belong there, and sacrifice in other words, spiritually, give all those thoughts to the worship and praise of Jesus Christ. Amen. The third thing it says is we are a holy nation. We are a holy nation. The Bible says, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now listen, people say, well, that, that's not possible. You know how hard it is to do that? We're not perfect. No, we're not. But I also know and in, in, the, in the book that we were just reading and in 1 Peter, the Bible does say, be ye holy, for I am holy. Mm -hmm. He says that twice. He says it in verse 15 of chapter number 1, and then he says it again in verse number 16, I believe. Verse 15, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Now listen, are we going to stumble because of the, the, the battle, the spiritual battle that goes on within us? Yes. But is it possible to desire to live a holy life? Yes. As a matter of fact, we should desire that. And we should strive in everything we do to be holy in every aspect of our lives. I think we need to stop conforming to this world and start striving to be holy as he is holy. Amen. We have been sold a bill of goods that, well, because of the times we're living in or because we have that, that sin nature that we can't live holy lives. That's the lie of the devil. Right. Because we have the power of Christ in us, the Holy Spirit of God, and he has told us, be ye holy for I am holy. Right. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Right. The Holy Spirit dwells within us. And then the last thing, because I'm out of time, is we are a peculiar people. <laughs> that word peculiar doesn't mean peculiar like we've known to, you know, like strange, odd. I mean, I guess you can think of it. What it really means is we're a, a possession we're possess a, a purchased people. We are God's own possession. Amen. We are purchased, what? With the blood of Jesus Christ. Right. In Titus chapter 2 and in verse 14, the Bible says, Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. We are purchased with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. But listen, with that, with that, there's a responsibility there is a price, if you will, that comes with that. And it says it at the end of that verse. Zealous of good works. We need to be zealous of doing right. Amen. Listen, we're zealous about a lot of things. Right. We're passionate about our sports teams. We're passionate about our entertainment. We're passionate about our, our, our you know, uh, the things that we like to do. I, listen, I get it. I'm as passionate as anybody. My emotions can be really high one day and really low the next day. We're passionate about a lot of things. But let me tell you something. The thing we need to be the most passionate about is serving our Lord Jesus Christ in holiness unto good works. Amen. And I think if we started doing that as, as Christians, as believers, and start to make a difference in this world, we would see a change. Right. We would start to see a change. Listen, why it's hard to do that. I can't do that. It's just impossible to do that. Listen, we can't do it in our own strength. But let me tell you this. God takes the ordinary and makes it extraordinary. Mm -hmm. God can take your life. He said, well, you know, I, I don't know that I can do it. Who am I? I'm just an ordinary person. Yeah. We all are. But God can take the ordinary person and make them extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Read through the scriptures. There is story after story after story, okay, of people. Think of Gideon. Who was Gideon? What did God call Gideon? Thou mighty man of valor. Mm -hmm. When you, If you look at the characteristics of who Gideon was, that would be the last thing that you would think of him. 
But God saw something in him that he didn't even see. Why? Because God was working in his life, and it was God. It was God. What was it about Gideon? It was his faith. It wasn't his strength, his power. It was his faith that made him a mighty man of all that God did something in his life that nobody else could have foreseen. And God can do the same thing in your life. Are you zealous unto good works? Are you willing to surrender and sacrifice yourself completely so that God can do something extraordinary in our lives? My prayer is that that would be a challenge to you. It's a verse that a lot of us have read and know. And, you know, every time I read it, I just get excited. Because it starts at salvation. Sanctification by the Spirit. And the end of it is it ends with being zealous for good works. May that be our heart today. May we be zealous to serve and do everything we can for the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. God, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lord, for our salvation. Thank you, Lord, that the Holy Spirit lives and dwells within each and every one of us. And that, Lord, the Spirit of God is still working in each and every one of us. Lord, I do pray that you would do a great and mighty work in each of us and work through us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.